No, I put slightly. See, plus I try. Yeah, it's nice. It's okay. Okay. Ah. Yeah, fine. So, uh, I'm actually very excited to be here because uh, a couple of years back I was also sitting on you know, these stairs and attending this workshop. And so it's a very nice feeling to be back here and you know talking to you guys about my research, right? Um, yeah, so over the last couple of days, you guys have been, um, you know, uh, looking at um, how we build phylogenetic trees, how you date these trees, and so on, right? Uh, but there's a whole bunch of things that we can do after you uh, build your trees. And uh, Janvi has already spoken to you about ancestral straight tree constructions. Uh, so today, I'll just be talking to you about um, the work I did and how you can use phylogenetic trees to understand um, species diversification in trade erosion, right? Um, so one of the most important questions in, in uh, evolutionary biology is what generates and maintains biodiversity, right? And there are two fundamental processes that uh, generate biodiversity. One is speciation, which is you know, the formation of new species from an ancestral population, and then extinction, which is the uh, removal of species from this tree of life, right? And these two processes together is what we call as a diversification. Right? And this gives the total number of species at any given time point. And this is basically what has resulted in the tree of life as we do it. Right? So when you look at the tree of life, the main thing that you'll notice is that the tree of life is highly asymmetrical in terms of species uh, uh, numbers. Right? For instance, if you look at this, this, uh, this you know, uh, point over there, the, the circle on top leads to this branch called a spinodon or Tuatara, which is a lizard-like reptile that you see uh, in New Zealand. And the lower circle is a branch that leads to birds, right? And if you look at the number of species, there's only one species of Tuatara, but there are at least, I don't know, more than 10,000 species of birds, even though both of them originated approximately at the same time here, some 250 million years ago, right? So why do we see such differences in, in different clays? And there are two main hypotheses that explain this. So one is what we call as the, the clay age hypothesis, which basically says that your species richness is, is correlated with the age of the clay, right? Uh, which means that older clays would have more number of species just because they've had uh, you know, so much time to evolve into different lineages. Right? And if you look at uh, you know, you know, different groups, you'll see that this doesn't always explain this. In certain groups, yes, you'll see that, okay, clade age is associated with the species richness, but in many of these other groups, you don't see those kind of patterns, right? So another hypothesis is that there is, your, your species richness is correlated to your diversification rates. That is the rates at which new species arise and the rates at which new species go extinct, right? And you see that uh, there's a lot of difference between um, different groups. And uh, what you'll see is, uh, so diversification rates, they, they vary across time. So here's an example from, uh, from insects. And what you'll see is, you know, your diversification rates have gone up and down several times, you know, over the last 300 million years, right? And such uh, variation across time is usually correlated with environmental factors. It could be Paleo, uh, paleo temperature, paleo, uh, you know, precipitation, rainfall, uh, biome shifts, whatever, right? But you can also see diversification rates changing across different lineages. Again, an example from insects, when, what you'll notice here is that uh, you see higher diversification rates in certain groups like um, butterflies, beetles, dipterins, and hymenopterans, right? And these are usually associated with certain traits uh, that these these clades have could be some kind of key innovation or whatever, right? So there's a lot of factors that can influence how your diversification rates uh, change, and there's been a lot of studies on this, looking at different groups of of uh, you know taxa. Well, mostly they've been looking at uh, species that are terrestrial, uh, arboreal, uh, aquatic, and so on. So here are a bunch of examples just to show you. Um, so if, uh, if you look at the, the diversification rates of uh, spiny rate fish, what you'll see is that the, there's a burst of diversification after uh, during cold, uh, you know, global cooling events, and after the evolution of an antifreeze glycoproteins. 
Similarly, in amphibians, you see the diversification rates increase uh, in association with the spread of angiosperms. Right? In birds, you see that diversification rates increase during colder periods and when there's forest fragmentation. And in many ungulates, you see that your diversification is associated with the spread of grasslands. Right? So there are a whole bunch of, of uh, different factors that can influence different groups uh, differently. Right? Uh, but what about you know species that live underground, right? How do these these environmental factors influence species that live underground? Now the first question is why should the underground environment be any different in the first place, right? So for one, your underground environment is structurally very very simple, right? So if you look at this image, which is not very clear here, if you look at the soil profile here, all you see is basically a whole bunch of soil and dirt and rocks, right? But if you just look above, you have a whole lot of structural variation. You have grasses, you have shrubs, you have tall trees, bark, foliage, leaf litter, all sorts of things. So the, the structurally, the above ground environment is very, very complex compared to your underground environment. Other than that, your underground environment is also uh, buffered from climatic uh, fluctuations. So for instance, um, you know, on a hot summer day, you might just go out and you'll see that your temperature might vary from, you know, 18 degrees to 30 degrees or whatever, right? Uh, even at midday afternoon, if you go out and maybe dig a couple of centimeters into the soil, you'll see that it's still very cool, right? So there's no, you don't see these extreme variations in your, uh, you know, uh, climatic parameters underground. So temperatures are more or less uh, quite stable, uh, humidity is stable, and so on. Right. You also see that you know, uh, organisms that are living underground experience much less predation compared to things that are living above ground. Right? So all these factors um, make the underground environment very stable and homogeneous. Right? Now, when you have such stable environments, it also facilitates the evolution of specializations. Right? Because uh, because usually specialists always uh, generally outcompete generalists, right? Uh, but there's a problem with the evolution of specialization in the sense that uh, you know they're specialists when that environment is stable, but when this environment is continuously changing, uh, specialists may not be able to adapt to these sudden environmental changes, right? So it makes them susceptible to environmental change, and so it's thought that specializations, ecological specializations, also in the long run increase the chances of Extinctions, and so it's generally thought of as an as an evolutionary dead end, all right? Uh, and now, fossoriality in snakes, right? Fossoriality means basically living underground, right? Fossoriality in snakes is a trait that imposes specializations at multiple different axes, right? The reason is burrowing into the oopsie. yeah. So burrowing into the soil is an extremely energy expensive. Uh, behavior, right? So you see that the net cost of burrowing is much, much higher than the net cost of walking or running, right? And to overcome these energy expense, uh, uh, you know, energy, uh, what do you say, requirements, they have a very specific morphology, right? Most burrowing animals are small, thin, and long, right? And if you look at the morphospace of, uh, you know, all the all the squamates you'll see that all the burrowing reptiles, that is these red points, occupy a very separate morphospace compared to all, all the other uh, groups of reptiles, uh, right? And, uh, and because of that, so burrowing um, reptiles have you know, tiny little heads, a very elongated trunk, and a very short tail. So this is what we call as the burrowing ecomorph, right? And, uh, and most burrowing reptiles burrow into the soil with their heads, right? And because of this, the head cranium of burrowing reptiles are extremely ossified and compact. So on the left here, this is a this is a uh, you know a CT scan of a shield-tail snake, and um, you see that the, the cranium is extremely compact, right? On the right, this is the cranium of a terrestrial viper, right? And what you'll see is that the cranial elements are not as compact as uh, you know as as you see here, and there are multiple you know gaps in between and so on, All right? So yeah. Oops. Okay. And because they have these extremely ossified craniums, they also don't have enough uh, enough space for jaw adductor muscles, 
right so there's a trade off between their burrowing ability and their bite force right and because of this you find that most fossorial animals feed on very soft body prey right so there's again specialization in your diet and in, in some cases uh, you know shield tails shield tails specifically eat only uh, only earthworms uh, but most of the other fossorial uh, reptiles tend to feed on slugs uh, snails and so on mostly soft body prey you also have specializations in their integuments so if you look at the scales of many of these fossorial snakes you see that they have these tiny micro ornamentations on each of these scales right and it is believed that these micro ornamentations reduce the wettability of the scale right so in the sense that when these uh, when these uh, snakes are burrowing into you know water log soil right the water adheres to the to the soil but not onto the skin so when they burrow into the soil it reduces the friction right um and many of these fossorial snakes also have very very thick dermis right so they have this huge layer of you know collagen bundle in their dermis and this is a very scaled image and the one in the center is a fossorial uh, boa and all of these others are terrestrial snakes and you can see that the dermis is extremely thick and this is again because there's a lot of friction when you are burrowing into the soil right and so there's a lot of wear and tear so when you have such thick this uh, thick uh, dermis it kind of uh, you know reduces the wear and tear when you are when you are burrowing into the soil there are also specializations in their uh, you know locomotion different species have different ways in which uh, they burrow into the soil some of them use a side by side motion some of them you know use their snout as a shovel um you know some of them just stick their heads into the soil and wiggle to make their burrows right and in some groups you have uh, according to I mean, depending on how they burrow into the soil you also have associated uh, what do you say inter uh, you know rearrangement of internal organs right for example um, this is how a shield tail snake burrows so they basically stick their head into the soil compress their body and then expand it so it's kind of like a train a train engine you know where you have the engine in front and the rest of the tail is just dragged along right and because of this you'll see that when you cut open a shield tail you'll see that the first one third of the body is just uh, you know is filled with red muscles right red muscles have a lot of mitochondria and is used for sustained work right and the, the rest of the body is just very flabby and it's you know it's uh, it's kind of um, ai yeah, and it's uh, covered with white muscles right uh, so all of these specializations make it very specific to living underground you know so uh, when a shield tail snake or any of these burrowing snakes come onto the surface it makes it very difficult for them to move away it makes it very difficult for them to you know uh, you know catch probably larger prey and so on right um so basically what i wanted to know was what are the macro evolutionary consequences of such specializations what are the macro evolutionary consequences of fossoriality in reptiles does becoming fossorial increase your chances of extinction right and the hypothesis is very simple, uh, simple you know you have very stable environments um and so you have specializations at multiple levels which basically reduce its ability to uh, you know uh, adapt to sudden changes and so you have extinctions right and the way i did this was i basically took this this huge phylogeny for squamates uh, squamates are just lizards and snakes together right and for each Uh, species on this tree i coded them as being fossorial or non fossorial and then i used a whole bunch of phylogenetic comparative methods to you know to estimate uh, speciation and extinction rates right um so one of the first things that i did is what we call is the binary state speciation and extinction model so i'm just going to very briefly explain to you what this model is so you understand what this does right so according to this model you have like two states right the zero and a one so in our case this is going to be uh, fossorial and non fossorial and each of the state has its own speciation and extinction rates so the speciation rate is is given by la lambda and the extinction rate is given by mu right there's also transition rates that is the rate at which you know a fossorial species becomes a non fossorial species and vice versa right so what we can do here is based on this model we can constrain different parameters and build a whole you know multiple different sets of models so i can build another model where i say you know speciation rates between fossorial and non fossorial are equal right i constrain it to be equal and i can build another model where i say okay speciation rates are different but extinction rates are equal right 
And then I can calculate the likelihood of observing this, this data given, uh, you know, uh, given this particular model, right? Uh, and I basically select the best fit model and then I estimate these, uh, these parameters, right? And when I do that, um, what I find is, when I look at the squametry, that is the, the snakes and the lizards together, I actually don't see much of a difference, you know, there's, everything is like very overlapping, right? So the blue here is fossorial and the red is not fossorial. So when I look at lizards again, I don't see much of a difference. There's quite a lot of overlap. Um, you know, there's not much of a difference in the diversification rates between fossorial versus non fossorial lizards. Um, but when I look at snakes, I see that fossorial species have lower speciation, uh, speciation rates, they have higher extinction rates, and their transition from fossorial to non fossorial uh, transition rates are much lower from fossorial to non fossorial. And uh, and this is this is only for snakes, but we don't see this pattern in lizards, right? So I also did another model, uh, used another model called the Hissey model. So there's a lot of problems with the Bisset model, right? Uh, in terms of um, you know it, it produces a lot of type one errors and so on. So what this model does? So I'm not going into details of this model, but if someone wants to know about it, um, you can ask me later, right? So what the Hissey model does is assumes that there's another hidden state that could be you know, and uh, that could be responsible for these uh, differences in diversification rate. It may not be the state that you're looking for, right? So basically, it's a, it's a very, uh, what do you say, another complicated version of the, the missing model. Right? And when we do this, again, I find the same pattern. I don't see any difference uh, for the squamate data set and the lizard data set, but when I look at snakes, you see that the net diversification rates are, are much lower for um, fossorial species, and the relative extinction rates are much higher for fossorial species, right? Um, so basically what I understand is, you know, fossorial spe uh, snakes experience lower speciation rates, uh, higher extinction rates, and they also transition from fossoriality to non-fossoriality much lesser, right? But we don't see this pattern in lizards, right? Um, so now, so now, you know, kind of supports my hypothesis that, okay, fine, you know, when you have these extreme specializations, you also have an increase in extinction rates, right? Uh, but I also wanted to see how, you know, how, uh, you know, fossorial species respond to environmental changes, right? And we know that in the, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, we know that in the Earth's history, I mean, the Earth has gone through several changes of high temperatures, low temperatures, you know, biome shifts and all that kind of stuff. Right, so I wanted to see how fossorial species, uh, you know, uh, adapt to these these environmental changes. So to do that, I focused on this group called shield tail snake. This is a snake. This is a group of snakes that I'm that is super dear to me, and I'm crazy in love with it. Right. Um, so these are a group of very beautiful snakes that are found only in India and Sri Lanka. Right. Um, and there are around like uh, 62 odd species, and there are a lot of species that are yet to be described, and so on. Uh, so these form a particular group um, in the in the entire snake phylogeny within within this larger group called Henochidia, right? So if you look at uh, uh, shield tail snakes, they belong to this family called Europeltidae, and the Europeltidae are sister to two other families called Anomochilidae and Cylindrophidae, which are again fossorial. They they live underground, right? But these two are distributed in southeast Southeast Asia, right? So I basically asked the question, is there temporal variation in diversification rates between, within shield tail snakes? And has, you know, has this diversification pattern been interrupted by periods of high extinction rates, right? Whenever there, is, there has been sudden environmental changes. And I mean, the, the, the methodology is fairly straightforward. We went out to field, collected a whole bunch of samples. Uh, took out tissue, extracted DNA for uh, you know, uh, and then sequenced a couple of genes. We built a phylogeny, dated the phylogeny using you know beast, what you guys learned today in the morning, and then we did a whole bunch of diversification analyses to to look at how speciation, speciation and extinction rates have changed. So the first thing that I did was I built what's called as a lineage through time plot, right? So what this plot basically does it just shows the accumulation of lineages over time, right? But what's interesting is the pattern of these, this lineage to time, time plot 
it'll give us clues on the underlying evolutionary model, right? For example, if you just have a constant birth death uh, model, right? If you just have constant, uh, you know, speciation, constant extinction, you'd see something like a very, you know, decent exponential curve. But when you have mass extinctions, uh, what you'd see on the entity plot is you'll see like a plateau region here. And we see that kind of in two regions, right? We see this huge plateau here and here. And you also see that this curve is slightly changing at around 10 million years, right? So now, based on this, I started testing these hypotheses, whether there were extinctions at this point, or whether there was rate shift, and so on. Uh, and so when I, when, I, you know, when I looked at these diversification rates across time, there are a whole bunch of different models that we use and stuff. Uh, what we find is that your diversification rates have been more or less constant from you know, 50 million years, that's when sheet tails originated, uh, to around you know, 11 million years. And then after that, there's a huge decrease in your diversification rates, right? And at the same time, you also have an increase in relative extinction rates at this, at this 11 million uh, year point, right? So interestingly, this, this time period also correlates to a time period where, uh, you know, forests were starting to contract and you were having uh, the expansion of grasslands, right? And so basically forest fragmentation is kind of constraining the diversification of uh, sheeted snakes. Uh, so I also wanted to look at extinction rates, right? So to do that, what I did was I simulated a whole bunch of um, you know uh, a whole bunch of phylogenetic trees with these uh, parameters, and I simulated mass extinction, uh, you know, uh, mass extinctions, and I compared it with simulations with no mass extinctions. And what I find is that when I simulate mass extinctions at these two periods, right? 55 and 34 with an extinction of uh, you know 95% means 95% of the sheet tails became extinct. This red line here represents the empirical data. That means the actual uh, sheet tail file or the LTT plot that we generated. So when we simulate these mass extinctions, you see that these gray lines kind of overlap the the actual empirical data. So it seems like there is a possibility of high extinctions during these two periods. Right. So I also used another uh, another model, which is called as a compound Poisson process and mass extinctions, a comet model, uh, right, which assumes mass extinctions as uh, you know as a Poisson process, and then tries to find the timing of these mass extinctions, right. And when I do this again, I find that the chances of extinctions are quite high at around this you know uh, 50 to 60 million years back here, and another mass extinction around 30 million years back. Now, if you look at the timings of this, right, 50 million years is when you know the Earth was extremely hot, right, and this 30 million years is when there was sudden drop in global temperatures. So what we see is whenever there's you know sudden changes or fluctuations in your temperature, we see higher extinctions, right. Uh, so I wanted to see again how you know diversification rates are correlated with uh, temperature. Paleo temperature. So we collected uh, information, you know, on paleo temperature across the Cenozoic, right? And we compared it. Uh, we looked at uh, the correlation with diversification rates. And what we find here is that your diversification rates are definitely correlated with paleo temperature. Um, and if you look at these these numbers, there's something very interesting here. So lambda is your speciation rate. Uh, alpha is the rate of change of speciation rate. Mu is your extinction rate, and beta is the rate of change of extinction rates. Okay, so what you'll notice is that your rate of change of extinction rate is much higher than the rate of change of speciation rate. So what this means is that for every one, uh, every you know one degree change in your temperature, you have a higher change in extinction rates rather than speciation rates, right? So which basically says that you know these groups are extremely sensitive to uh, paleo environment. So just to summarize the whole thing, right? We see two mass extinction events, one at 50 and one at 30, when the temperature was super high, and then there is a sudden drop in temperature. Right? We also see lower speciation or lower diversification rates around this period when there was a change from forest habitats, um, and, uh, you know, and then there was grassland expansion and you know, there was fragmentation of forests. Right? So what we understand from this is that you know, although it is thought that your 
your underground environments are are buffering species from you know extreme environmental temperatures right the fusorial species is so specialized that even tiny little changes you know can affect them really badly right and it's very important to kind of understand these these processes because it also gives us a sense of how these species would adapt to you know future environmental fluctuations right given these these this entire scenario uh, given the current rate at which you know climate is changing it's very it seems like a very bleak future for for uh, europe and snake so you get a whole bunch of you know just by looking at the phylogeny you get you get to answer a whole bunch of different different questions right uh, but i'm also going to talk to you about something else so so far we were looking at diversification rates but i'm also going to talk about how we can use phylogenies to understand uh, trait evolution right so janvi has already spoken to you a bit about um, ancestral trait reconstructions but i won't be talking to you about that i'll be uh, talking to you about the speed at which different traits evolve right so one of the most fascinating things about shield is that it's extremely beautiful and this is something that that fascinated me throughout my phd i was always wondering why the hell the, these fossorial snakes have these brilliant colors right and most of these species have these bright yellow and red colorations right and um, now this is very perplexing because uh, these are fossorial species right and colors are a visual signal that means you need light to be able to see colors and these are underground where there's no light so why would something that lives underground have these bright colorations okay so i'm going to you know as it turns out um, these colorations are an are, are a part of this huge elaborate anti predatory strategy all right uh, so what they do is uh, birds are one of the main predators of uh, of shield tail snakes so what they do is when when you basically annoy them they curl up into a coil and they hide their heads in between these coils and then they display their tails right you can see that here this is the this is the tail this is not the head right and the tail of shield tail snakes is is very broad it kind of looks like the head they also have these you know like yellow stripes on the side and all that with kind of make it look uh, like the head right and this is what we call as cephalic mimicry so what happens is when birds try to attack these they get confused of what is what and end up diverting all their attacks towards the tail right now another consequence of diverting this attack towards the tail is that it increases the handling time for the bird to actually figure out which is what you know then attack the head kill the snake and then consume the snake right so it takes a lot of time for the bird to figure this out and then eat the snake so it would be much more easier for a bird to just eat something else rather than eat, eating this so it makes these snakes very unprofitable right and we did a whole bunch of experiments and we kind of show that you know shield tail snakes use these colorations to advertise this handling time right uh again i'm not going into details of these behavioral experiments but uh, if you guys are interested you can go back to these papers and then you know uh, get a sense of uh what we did the main point is that there are other consequences to evolving such anti predatory strategies right so one thing is when you have such warning signals it allows you to be more you know open right you don't have to be worried about predators you can be more open you can go around you can start using utilizing more resources in your environment and invariably it leads to niche expansion right and when you have niche ex expansion you can have you can also have associated uh, consequences for diversification as well right so here's an example that kind of shows this um so this is a a a, a species of dendrobatid frog right uh so this group of frogs uh, they produce toxins and they advertise these uh, uh they are opposed i mean that they are that they are toxic with these bright colorations but what you see all of these are the same species this is a polymorphic species uh, of dendrobatid frog i can't remember what the species name is um and what you'll see is that there's a lot of difference in the behaviors of these uh, uh you know of these uh, these uh, polymorphic populations So what they found is that more conspicuous frogs tend to be more aggressive, more exploratory in nature. Uh, they find they they spend less time hiding and they spend more time foraging, right? And there are multiple uh, examples like these that kind of show that okay, when you have these anti-predatory strategies, you also have uh, it also allows you to expand your niche. Right. So now coming back to fusoriality, right? So I told you that the cost of borrowing is much much higher than the cost of uh, of uh, you know walking or running, and it's been shown.
shown that the work required to burrow into the soil increases exponentially as your body becomes bigger, uh, with increases exponentially with body diameter, right? Um, and so what you see is the more fusorial you become, the more thin and long you have to be to be able to burrow efficiently, right? Um, and it's also been shown that burrowing is highly correlated to head morphology in reptiles because they burrow with their heads. So the more burrow, uh, the more fusorial you are, you tend to have like very pointed heads. Um, and the more surface you, uh, surface dwelling you, dwelling you are, you tend to have much more broader and robust uh, heads, right? So there's this very specific burrowing ecomorph, uh, ecomorph like I told you earlier. Right. So what I wanted to ask was, uh, is coloration correlated with body morphology? Because these this antipredatory difference in, in shield tail snakes is when they actually come out, right? When they come near the surface or when they come out, uh, you know, uh, onto the surface, that is when these these anti-predatory strategies work, right? So, uh, so do you see that the ones that are more colorful, right? Do they have a much more robust body morphology, which kind of indicates that they're more surface dwelling, right? They're more surface active, right? Um, and I also wanted to see whether these colorations have influenced the rates of morphological evolution, because when you are like I said, you know, when you have uh, these anti-predatory strategies, you can, uh, you know, you can uh, be more exposed, right? In terms of shield tails, they can probably come out onto the surface more often, right? And so what it does is it kind of reduces the constraints that are imposed by fusoriality, right? And so you will have a burst of, uh, you know, morphological diversification, right? So to ask to do this, what I did was I basically quantified coloration in these snakes, um, I asked like 45 people to score the coloration of the dorsal and the ventral, uh, you know, and then I basically added this up to get an overall conspicuousness score. And I also collected morphological data for a whole bunch of samples, and I focused on this one uh, genus called Europeltis, right? And so what I did is based on this this conspicuousness score, I you know arbitrarily binarized it, giving different thresholds. Again, these are not very very important. And then I did a whole bunch of, you know, phylogenetic comparative analyses, right? So what we see here is that your overall coloration, uh, you, 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 what you see here is that there's a clear correlation between your mid-body width and your uh, overall uh, proportion of coloration. So the species that are more colorful have much more uh, thicker bodies, right? Uh, I also did, you know, uh, PCA, which uh, you know, on all these morpho uh, morphological variables. Again, I'm not going to explain all these statistics. Uh, and then we looked at whether these PCAs are, you know, are, uh, are you know, kind of uh, predict your coloration. And again, what we see is that species that are uh, more colorful tend to have much more robust body morphologies. They have wider heads, right? And uh, yeah, and, and the ones that are uh, you know, less colorful, they, they tend to be extremely thin and long, which kind of supports our hypothesis that, you know, colorful ones are more surface dwelling because these robust morphologies are associated with m moving on the surface. Right? Uh, I also wanted to look at the rates of morphological evolution, right? So what we did, we fit a whole bunch of, um, you know, trait evolution models, okay? Again, I'm not going into details of this, but if you're interested, we can talk about it uh, later, right? So I fit different single rate and multi-rate models to see, uh, and, and basically, you know, look at which model fits my data set the best. And what we found is that the, uh, a multi-rate model best explained our data set, and what you'll see here is these are the rates of trait evolution, right? And what you'll see here is that more conspicuous species had higher rates of morphological evolution. Right. We also did another analysis again, you know, which kind of basically says the same thing. Right. More conspicuous species have higher rates of morphological evolution compared to species that are less conspicuous. So what this means is that species, as they come onto the surface, you know, because they have these colorations, they are basically, uh, you know, these constraints associated with fusoriality are decreasing, and so there's uh, there's more chances to diverge on this morphological axis. Right. So yeah, so this is basically a review of everything. Conspicuous species are associated with more robust body morphologies. Um, 
species that are more colorful also have higher rates of morphological evolution, right? And this is because these constraints of uh, imposed by fossoriality are going away. Right? So the big picture, you know, we see that um, you know fossoriality has a has a negative influence on diversification rates of of uh, snakes. Uh, fossorial snakes experience uh, lower speciation rates, higher extinction rates. We also see that because they're so specialized, uh, they're also very susceptible to environmental changes, right? Any sudden fluctuations in your environment, uh, you see that there's a peak in extinction rates, right? But you know, it's not that all is lost. There are other ways that they can overcome these. Uh, so the evolution of anti-predatory strategies, right, could accelerate you know, morphological diversification. And this ultimately could lead to niche expansion and again, you know, um, species diversification as well. All right? Yeah, so, so this is basically it. Um, I just wanted to tell you how we can use phylogenies for a whole bunch of, um, you know, different, uh, you know, questions to address for a whole bunch of different questions. Yeah, thank you. So if you guys have any questions, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, so um, so I did those for the behavioral experiments uh, where we modeled the coloration of uh, shield tail snakes given that background that they are in and uh, looked at how conspicuous they are for bird vision. Then turns out uh, shield tail colorations are like super visible <laughs> to birds, even on that, you know, leaf litter, cryptic, whatever background they are in. Yeah, but we didn't do that for this uh, scoring here. So we did that during the, our behavioral experiments. <laughs> So given the changing environment and climate, so do you think that these color traits could be under positive selection because it allows um, them to expand their niche space? Could be, could be. Um, but yeah, we, we, we really don't know. I mean, in, in general, these colorations are in positive selection because they are having uh, an anti-predatory advantage as well, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't really know how, you know, this would, um, Having these colorations, you know, would relate to environmental change and so on. Um, but yeah, it's possible. Okay. You mentioned yeah. about the larger uh, body species; they have uh, colors. Yes. Yeah. Uh, more. Correct. But uh, the thing is that small size shield tails and the larger ones. Yeah. Both are actually visible to uh, predators right, yes. because of the, you know, that shining. Um. So um, you're saying that it's iridescent, and so you can see it, is it? Yeah, yeah. So iridescence, again, you can see it only when you're very close. You can't see it when you're far, right? So if you notice, all most of these shield tails have these bright colorations on only on the underside, right? Uh, now, there's an advantage to being hidden in the first place, right? If you have these bright colors everywhere, things from far away can also spot you, right? Uh, but the reason, the probable reason why these colorations are only restricted to the underbelly is that you shouldn't be able to see these snakes from far away, but when you come close, you know, they coil up and they show, basically display these colors. But few of the, I mean, I don't know all the species, but most of the species like the sky is shield tail or this, yeah, so from upside they will show like... That is iridescence. Okay, so iridescence also you cannot see it from far. So that is why it's called as a black shield tail. Right, so it's uh, iridescence is always distance dependent, right? So when you see it from far, it's just black, okay? It's only when you go close that you see this iridescent pattern. Yeah. And they usually come out uh, in the post monsoon. Yes, so um, we don't really know why they come out. Um, one of the hypotheses is that uh, their burrows get flooded and so they come out, uh, but we have no idea of why exactly they're coming out. And from, like, if you compare, uh, like, different uh, geographical areas based on the rainfall and soil, you know, just humidity and soil texture, yeah. uh, the more drier, they go more deep inside? Um, so, uh, we're not really sure again, okay, because there's not a lot of ecological information that's yeah. there for shield tails. Uh, but that seems to be the case uh, because 
um, species that are in drier regions tend to be, uh, at least seem to be more fusorial. They seem to have this thin and long body, along, uh, you know, elongated morphologies, right? Um, but again, that kind of needs to be. That means detected. old word, um, I don't know, is it a right term or not? Old word sheep tails have more. So all of the sheep tails are old word. They're all only in India, right? Um, no, no the, I'm asking about the, the identification events in the Deccan. So um, I, I, I probably didn't get your question. What is that? So. There were some species like before the edification event. Still now they are like existing. Um, uh, we we don't know, right? I mean, <laughs> so in the sense that you can't say. I mean, your edification happened like around ten million years back, right? And we can't say that the the lineages that we are seeing today that arose ten million years back can't really say that it's the same species, right? Because there's also a lot of extinctions that happen. So if you look at our, uh, our analyses, we see that there was high relative extinctions during this, this period of aridification as well, right? So there could be a lot of species that were there and then became extinct. And what we see in the phylogeny right now is only the extinct species. So there might be a whole bunch of species. The tree wouldn't look like this, right? The tree would be a whole bunch of other branches coming here and there and then stopping, uh, right? Because of extinctions. Yeah. So uh, my understanding of this uh, stable environment is slightly different. Like, okay. Uh, so I, I'll give you an example of Himalaya. So uh, like it's easy, for, uh, like temperature can fluctuate a lot in air than the uh, soil. So in that way, soil is more constant and uh, constant environment. Mm. But uh, if, if we look at uh, that perspective in terms of safety for environment, then we also have to incorporate the ability of species, how, like, uh, like that, how they are moving. So if, if birds in winter they migrate to a lower elevation, so yeah. they, they find their uh, optimum temperature. Yeah. But in case of pika and the skinks, they hibernate. And there are also a lot of factors uh, like uh, winter snowfall. Yeah. So there is a more winter snowfall, yeah. and actually provides the insula insulation yeah. to the soil. Yeah. So then they get more constant environment. So yeah. if there is an adverse environment, less snowfall, then the adversity is also more constant. So in that way, it is not, it, it also like, you also have to incorporate the ability of the species to how they are moving. If they are less mobile, then the constant environment is more unsafe than this. Uh, oh, okay. Types. So oh, basically, um, so you're saying that we haven't included dispersal abilities here. Is, yes. that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, because, yes. Yeah, so in the sense that, you know, when they have these sudden environmental changes, you know, they're moving yeah, to so places that are, so have less... Are slightly higher to the tropic level, like they are predators. So if, if some of the factors that are affecting the earth form uh, yeah. survival uh, is also affecting the silted survival, which we are not taking into account. Uh, I, I didn't get that point, yeah? So, children are predators, right? Yes, yes, correct. So, maybe there are some factors which is affecting their prey, which is so specific. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that could also happen. So, absolutely. Yeah. So, it is very dynamic. It's yes, not yes. very Ab constant. Ab absolutely. No, ab absolutely. The other thing is that if you look at the distribution ranges of sheep tail, most species have very restricted distributions, right? Which basically, and this is the case with most fusorial, uh, uh, fusorial species that they don't disperse as much, right? Uh, th their dispersal ability in general is very low because again, you know, uh, but again, ecologically speaking, we don't have that information. But like you said, it could, it could just be something that's affecting its prey and that could be affecting this as well. But ultimately, our, our, our point in that, what it's showing is whenever you have any of these adverse, uh, you know, climates, it's still affecting your sheet rates, right? It's still affecting this group. So the mechanism of how it's affecting may be varied. It may be affecting the prey, it may be affecting uh, possibly, uh, you know, uh, thermal tolerance and all of these things, right? So is there a chances that they are using different that to maintain the temperature? So, yeah, we don't have that information for shield tails, but that is known in a couple of other fusorial uh, lizards where 
uh, they do kind of regulate their body temperature by going uh, by this vertical uh, movement you know they, they go into deeper um, you know soil when it's like really hot and come up and all that stuff uh, but again it's not like you know they go like super deep or anything uh, uh, but yeah they, they definitely do that So is there any study that has explicitly tested if this colorful and morphologically more robust shade tails are spending more time above ground compared to the less colorful shade tails? Oh no, so that's not been explicitly tested because uh, there are a lot of people who are working on shade tails but if anyone wants to it would be really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, this is now a hypothesis that can be uh, tested, right? Is coloration only for hiding from birds or for breeding? Uh, or for? This coloration is it for breeding? Oh, okay. So uh, it's very unlikely that it is for sexual selection because um, fusorial snakes in general have very, very tiny eyes. Okay? And what's interesting is people have looked at the expression of obscene genes in fusorial snakes. And they express only one obscene gene, okay, which is on the uh, what, what what is the uh, yeah low wavelength uh, obscene gene, right? And all these colors, red and yellow, are high wavelength, uh, so it's very unlikely that they can see these colors, <laughs> right? So it's it's yeah, it's it's not uh, for sexual selection. <laughs> it's not associated with sexual selection. Very uh, very much associated with uh, something else, from. <laughs> then do you think like sexual selection will be uh, with the pheromone? Could be. Uh, uh, I mean, again, it's difficult, like because of the soil, uh, the moistness they live. So there are other so these things they are dominating, like fungal. Like, no, that's that's there, but uh, it's very likely that fossorial species use uh, you know chemical cues because. This has been shown in other uh, fusorial uh, reptiles um, where they're, they're highly chemo, chemoreceptive. In general, snakes by default are highly chemoreceptive, right? So, uh, turns out fusorial species do have, um, uh, some of these fusorial species at least do have uh, chemical pheromones that they, you know, potentially use to attract mates and so on. Um, but right now with shield tails, we don't know. Um, is this colors like is it an ancestral strain or is it there in every of the species or even chain tree? So we for this particular analysis we looked at only Europeltis, right? But if you look at the entire tree, there are other clades that also have these colorations, right? So if the these colorations evolved uh, multiple times in the uh, probably, I don't know if it's multiple times, but these colorations have evolved much earlier in, in this uh, phylogeny. No, what I'm trying to understand is, like we said about the pressure, the yeah. like selection pressure. So yeah. I'm trying to understand, was it an ancestral character that is being present there or it is there or something? It very likely is, because the sister species to these uh, Europeptids, which I told you that's there in Southeast Asia, right? Uh, the cylindrophids and the um, anoma chylids, they also have very bright colorations, right? Um, so it's very likely that uh, in shield this these colorations are an ancestral state, um, you know, character, right? Uh, but if you also notice, the, these patterns of colorations are quite widespread in a lot of uh, fusorial snakes. So um, you look at other, uh, uh, you know, groups of fusorial snakes, you'll also see that they have similar color, uh, colorations. So uh, it's not known whether, uh, you know, there's some kind of correlation between uh, fusoriality and evolving these colors, right? Uh, but yeah, that is something that we need to test and something that I've been wanting to do for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, no, you, yeah, you find it at uh, all sorts of ele elevations. You see uh, many species at uh, very close to sea level um, and you see them right up onto the hills as well. Very confusing because the sheep tails show different this thing, and the other, you know, fossorial snakes like worm snakes, they I mean, color and everything. So, um, you're saying that the worm snakes don't have coloration? No, is that, is that it's white, right? So, here, I mean, it's bright color, yeah, 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 correct. So, 
again, it's probably because there are different selection pressures for worm snakes, right? Um, uh, I don't know what the predators are for worm snakes. I'm pretty sure birds are definitely one of them. Um, but it also could be that they don't really come out as much as uh, sheet is, right? Um, so during the monsoons, these things are, at least in certain places, they're super common. Right? Um, and there are a lot of these terrestrial birds that actually dig the top layer of soil. So if you've seen um, uh, chickens and jungle fowls and red uh, spur fowls and all that, they actually remove leaf litter, you know. Uh, and so those kind of uh, birds are very likely going to see uh, these sheep tails, right? So it, it depends on the selection pressure. So, uh, you know, with worm snakes, it could be some completely different, uh, 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 you know, set of selection pressures. Uh, but again, there are a lot of worm snakes that do have bright colorations, right? Uh, not in India, <laughs> but there are quite a few worm snakes that have, uh, you know, these yellow bands and so on. Um, I don't remember where these are from, but there are worm snakes that do have coloration. But the coral snake might be showing like similar stuff, antiquated stuff. So coral right? snakes are venomous, so it's very likely an aposematic coloration. Oh, they do that as well, correct. Yeah, they, the, many of them do display the, the tails. Um, so, uh, yeah, so turns out that itself can have uh, its own anti-predatory advantage. Uh, so one of the most, I mean, one of the, the hypotheses behind these uh, Europentids having colorations was initially mimicry uh, with coral snakes, right? But now if you, if you look at most of these shield tails, there are very few shield tails that actually have red coloration. And all the uh, coral snakes that we have here are, are red in color, right? It's either red or blue. Um, uh, and most of the shield tails are yellow in coloration, right? So when you have mimicry, you usually have, you know, and birds are very quick at learning this, you know, they're very good at differentiating uh, colors and so on, right? So if it's, if it's mimicry, you would ideally see a lot more, you know, uh, snakes that look like coral snakes, but most of the shield tails are actually red in color. Oh, no, sorry, yellow in color, my mistake, yeah. Awesome. So, um, is that it? Maybe one out of your subject, this yeah. workshop question. How do you sample those many sheet tails? Oh, a painful process. <laughs> 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 so we the morning push monsoon. So, um, so usually it's during the monsoons, uh, rather than post monsoons, pre monsoons. Uh, the first rains are really good. So we, uh, there are different ways in which we can sample. For reptiles, one of the best ways is to just, you know, road cruise. You'll see a lot of um, snakes on the road, especially when it's raining. Uh, but other than that, I go, I kind of lift heavy logs and rocks, and I dig into the soil, all right? Um, and a lot of the times you won't, uh, you won't get anything. So if you dig like one 50 to 100, uh, uh, you lift like 50 to 100, 100 logs and then dig under that, you might get one. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, but sometimes you're just super lucky and under one log you might get 10, 15. <laughs> yeah. Are you done? Yeah. Cool.